Why does just splitting an Ethernet cable not work? I thought the Ethernet is logically a one-line communication bus, for argument's sake, I am excluding hubs. All machines attached on the bus hears the same signals and the machines themselves try to avoid collisions by randomly backing off. This URL. If so, why would splitting one Ethernet line from my home router into two and connecting two computers not work? Why do I have to add a switch to it? What the internet said would not work. What the internet said I should do. Is this because of the signal degradation, reduced electric current? Thank you for all the answers. The reason why I did not just use the two ports of my home router is. The 4 port gigabit router is in my room, and I had put a computer in another room, also my room, though. Since a wired network is far more reliable and secure, I had bought a long ethernet cable and, and connected the computer to the router. Now I was thinking about adding another computer to that room. I could buy another long ethernet cable, but then there will be two cables between the rooms. The one line already is a minor annoyance, so I thought if I could share the one line between the two computers in that room. A switch would work, but it requires power and is a little bit pricey. That is why I wondered why it would not work to simply split the physical ethernet cable. Apparently I do not completely understand how ethernet and a switch work. I just have some bit of knowledge I heard in my college class. The original Ethernet spec called for coaxial cables that were tapped, split, to each workstation, hence the Ether and Ethernet. But we're talking ancient history here. Technically it's still possible with RJ45 cables since the Ethernet protocol still supports the collision detection mechanisms, but why in God's name would you want to set it up that way? Especially since your router has four ports to work with in the first place. In 10 base T and 100 base TX, one pair of wires is used for transmitting, and one for receiving. That is, one pair is the pair the Ethernet host transmits on, and the hub or switch receives on, and the other pair is the pair that the, the hub switch transmits on, and the Ethernet host receives on. If you split the cable with a simple passive splitter, you're hooking up those two Ethernet hosts transmitter to transmitter and receiver to receiver. That's like holding the phone handset upside down and trying to speak into the speaker and listen to the microphone, it just doesn't work. So even if both were in half duplex mode, like they were hooked to a hub, not a switch, neither of the Ethernet hosts would be able to sense when the other was transmitting because neither one's receiver was hooked up to the other one's transmitter. So they would have undetectable collisions. Not to mention that they'd both be connected to the same port of the hub, probably confusing the hub's auto-negotiation ability because hubs don't expect to auto-negotiate with two separate hosts on the same port. In many ways, things are even worse in your case of hooking them both up to a switch, because they could both end up thinking they can do full duplex, which means even more undetectable collisions, on what's supposed to be a collision-free link, properly wired full duplex links can't possibly have collisions. With 1000 base, T, gigabit Ethernet over CAT5 or better up copper cabling, the situation is even worse, because all four pairs of wires are used for both transmit and receive, simultaneous, full duplex, and the transceivers are sophisticated enough to enable that. But if you suddenly have a third party on the line transmitting and receiving all at the same time, it completely blows away the way the simultaneous bidirectional signaling scheme works. With three devices all transmitting at the same time, even when you subtract out your own transmission, you can't differentiate the other two devices' transmissions in the signal you're receiving. Some early flavors of Ethernet, such as 10 base, 2 aka, thin net, aka, cheaper net, featured a bus topology where all the hosts on the LAN literally shared the same wire, the same coaxial cable. Because the same wire was used for both TX and RX and there could be any number of hosts on the bus, it had to be half duplex. But a 10 base, 2 transceiver was expecting it to be that way. And since all the transmitters and receivers were hooked up to the same wire, everyone could hear each other, unlike your split 10, 100, 1000 base, T example. I'm surprised I must disagree with Spiff in a sense it does work. We were hunting the cause of excessive packet errors in the factory. 
Among other things we found where some electrician had simply spliced a Y into a 100 base T network cable. The two computers involved sometimes had network errors, but since this persisted for a long time while the users used a program that was on the network and all its data, except stuff written to the temp directory, was on the network I can conclusively say it's possible. The switches are the traffic lights of the network, without them packets run into each other badly. Normally the network protocol makes up for the lost packets, though. If one were to split a cable such that two devices receive inputs got data from the third device's transmitter, and the first two devices transmitters fed the third device's receiver, then data transmitted by the third device might be received by the first two, and it's even possible that the third device might hear data transmitted by one of the first two, but reliability in either case would be poor. Imagine a cable as a slinky brand spring toy which is hanging vertically and floating at the bottom. If one briefly jostles the top of the spring, a wave will travel down the spring to the bottom, whereupon it will be reflected back up. Fastening the bottom end to the floor won't solve the problem. It will reverse the polarity of the reflected wave, but the reflection will still be there. The only way to avoid a reflection at the bottom of the spring would be to have enough give to prevent a like phase reflection, but not so much give as to cause an anti-phase reflection. Internet cables operate much the same way a device sends out pulses and expects that the other device will have just enough give to absorb them cleanly. Any place the characteristics of a cable change will cause reflections and other such unwanted effects unless proper measures are taken to prevent them. If packets are sufficiently short, and code waits long enough before sending a packet then any reflections which were propagating through the cable have died down enough, it may be possible for some data to be sent through the cable. Since Ethernet communications generally don't include such delays, however, communications are apt to be unreliable. It's possible that a device might transmit e.g. the first 10 packets of data it wants to send, resulting in the first two being received and the rest being garbled by the first, the receiver might, upon receiving the second packet, hold off on acknowledging it until it decides no more data is coming immediately, conveniently not making that determination until after the noise has died down. Upon getting the acknowledgement from the second packet, the transmitter would send the third through twelfth packets, again, with only two of the ten making it, the receiver would acknowledge the fourth, etc. Data might make it through, but slowly at best. Fresh the